that, so please join us. Um, in uh, 1999, I uh, got a very interesting commission to receive the year 2000 in the Socolo Square in Mexico City, if you're familiar with the Socolo Square. It has, at the time of uh, 1999, it had the National Palace, which was the PRI, the center left. The, the PRD was in the municipal uh, government building on the bottom. On the top is the cathedral, so the right wing, the PAN. And the fourth wall was the jewelry shops and hotels, so the money. And underneath was Tenochtitlan. So the idea is, how can you transform a site that is already so um, uh, prescri uh, prescribed or inscribed with different histories? Mm -hmm. And in addition, it fits like 300,000 people, right? So um, at any given time in the Sokolov Square, when there's like three protests going on at the same time, nobody pays attention because there's like 5,000 pharmacists and 3,000 taxi drivers, and there's just nothing, nothing. The scale just subsumes any potential for, for, um, for protests. So the only place that wasn't taken over and we studied was the sky. And we um, looked at the lighting of uh, powerful anti-aircraft searchlights. On the top left, you have on the end of the 19th century, the World Expo in Paris, where these lights were used as beacons of the arrival of modernity, this new uh, energy called electricity. Um, on the top right, you have Albert Speer's Nuremberg, Nuremberg rallies, where the lights were used for intimidation, the idea of creating an architecture where the message is, we are big and you are small. After the Second World War, the very same lights used in, in anti-aircraft surveillance were used for victory parades. And as of today, we think of these lights as something celebratory, like the opening of a new shopping mall or discotheque. On the bottom left is, is some of that. It's like uh, Times Square. And then on the bottom right, the most problematic of them all is Jean-Michel Jarre's $56 million extravaganza at the pyramids of Egypt to receive the year 2000. The reason I call it more, most problematic is because here is this kind of neo-colonial um, approach where the authorities in Egypt hire a French guy to show the grandeur of the, of the, of the Egyptian legacy. And there's this kind of identitarian sort of um, drive in all of these Son of Lumière shows that I find really repulsive. Um, and of course, I'm envious of his budget. So, <laughs> And it's a funny story because uh, the day that they did this million dollar, tens of millions of dollars show, there was fog on the on the Nile, and uh, very few people actually saw the show. So that was that's excellent. All right. So my proposal: um, can we keep the the volume muted? Because I can't control the. It's muted. Okay, perfect. So the project. Uh, was this to put um, 18 searchlights in the rooftops surrounding the um, the Sokolo and create a web page where anybody from anywhere could design a light sculpture so they could direct these lights and visualize it in in a virtual view in the web page um, and put your name and your dedication so you can make a, a light design. This is 1999, so that was a big deal back then to simulate 3D like that. Now we have like Google Earth and stuff like that. And once you were happy with your design, you would send it to Mexico City with your name, dedications, where you were contact from. And um, what ended up happening is um, every night for two weeks, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., we would render the designs as they arrived uh, from the internet for about like eight or 10 seconds. And um, the piece wasn't really a show. It didn't have a beginning or an end. It didn't have a proscenium or a privileged viewpoint for the authorities or the rich people. It was just sort of taking over the entire skyline in um, the historic center of Mexico. And um, in Mexico City, we have beautiful pollution, which was really good for <laughs> the lights because it functioned almost as a, as a natural uh, smoke machine. Um, and. You, you're seeing just, uh, I think of this kind of work more as a fountain than as a show. It's just something that's constantly transforming itself. The important thing about this project is if those lights are moving, it's because someone on the internet is activating them. So this idea of responsibility of the participant to actually drive the piece. This is, for instance, a scene at 8 p.m. on like December 28th. The activities of the city are still ongoing, but people take a moment to stand and look at the... Um, at the light displays. Um, one thing to note is as soon as you see the, the lights, they stop for a brief second 
And when they do, we automatically photograph them from webcams, uh, three or four webcams around the area. And we would make a web page for each and every participant who actually activated the lights. So you'd get an email saying, here's your web page, and I'll show you some examples of it. The idea is that in Mexico in 1999, we'd been voting against the PRI and nothing had happened So for 90 years. So the idea that participation was a vehicle for transformation was important. So here you have some example web pages. On the left are the virtual views of what you did from home or school or from work. And on the right, the actual photographs taken to prove to people that your design really did take place. Crucially, in each one of these web pages, there's these comments. Most of the comments are things like, I dedicate this design to Margarita, who's at the hospital. I hope you get better. But we also had a lot of Zapatista slogans back in 99. That was a very active community. Um, and it was uncensored and unmoderated, and I'm very proud of that. None of my pieces have ever been censored. Um, can we uh, cue the sound, please? I can't control the Here's here. Feedback and dedication. <laughs> No, más que nada son sistemas computarizados manejados de luces, pero no, no, no interviene nada de internet. Son sistemas sí, sí, sí. Can I ask you two more favors? Can you turn these two lights off my face? And can I get a bit more water? That'd be awesome. Two, two requests. Thank you. So through the media and through word of mouth, people would find out that if those lights were moving, it's because someone was participating. In uh, the two weeks that the project was live, we got 800,000 participants from 89 countries, and a total of 70% of the traffic was coming from different regions in Mexico. But imagine, if no one had participated, the project would not be there at all. Thank you so much. Same project, except in a different location, with a better camera, so at least we see a little bit more of the detail of the, of the work. This is at the Place Belcourt in Lyon. Uh, in 2004. The key thing for me is the people just hanging out in public space. That's what I think is radical. To think of ways for people to occupy public space in activities other than shopping. How is it that as artists we can make people share space Right, without uh, you know, just going you know the same plaza. You've been walking through it for 20 years or whatever, going back home or going to get, get your car from the car car lot. But here, people are invited to spend that time, and I think that that is a really important and almost utopianly fundamental part of democratic potential. Is how can us artists interrupt the narratives that we normally have in a public space to share experiences? So. Again, in, um, in, um, in uh, Lyon, we also got 500,000 participants and so on. The last version we made was for the Olympics in uh, Vancouver. And now, by now, the, the technology had improved. So now you had Google Earth, and Google's um, Earth allowed you to already have all of the 3D buildings. And so you would make your designs with this new kind of interface. And. Um, um, what else to say about this piece? Um, I guess just this idea that what we're doing in our uh, internet or our phones is always so personal and we're kind of closed in and it's not really having an impact onto the real world. So the idea to misuse these technologies, this is like 220,000 watts of power controlled by the people is an inversion that I'm interested in. When I did this in Vancouver, and I'm sure here you're also pretty environmental, uh, I was called uh, Environmental September 11. Um, so, you know, 
I have kids, so I care about the environment. And I quickly found a way to explain it to people. I said, yes, this uses a lot of power. It's also a 20th of what a typical hockey game uses. And the Canadians say, you don't touch your hockey. They're all like, okay, well, that's fine. All right, so it's a 20th of hockey game. So that was that. Um, in 2001, um, I was commissioned to transform this Howard plane in Rotterdam. And uh, as part of my scouting, I found this engraving by Samuel von Hoogstraat, and who was a disciple of Rembrandt, who, like Rembrandt, used shadow plays to understand perspective. One of the things I loved about this particular uh, engraving made in Rotterdam is that the, the relationship between scale and the demonic. So the large, large shadows are, you know, demons and the small ones are angelical and pure. And so this um, relationship between scale and monstrosity was the starting point for this project called Body Movies. Body Movies um, was a very large projection um, onto, we had two projectors which would project thousands of portraits of people from the cities of Rotterdam onto a building 60 foot high. And um, we also had um, very bright projectors on the ground which would cast this bright light which would wash away the projectors. So as people passed through the bottom projectors they'd cast their shadow and as you walk to close or far away from the facade your shadow would grow from six feet all the way to um, 70 feet or 80 feet. Um, and as you did that, a game of representation ensued. So all of a sudden, people would embody the portrait.